Welcome. My name is Beth, and I'm here on behalf of the Student Academic Success Team at Ambrose University. Whether you're joining us live today or whether you're watching later, I'm so glad that you're with us. At Ambrose, the Student Academic Success Team is here to help you thrive both in the classroom and throughout your career. Whether you're writing a paper, studying for an exam, preparing a budget, uh, writing a resume, uh, we hope that these sessions so far have helped you develop some of the core skills that will help you succeed. Today, we wanna to round out our discussion by focusing on presentation skills. Um, now, this is often a topic that raises anxiety. Uh, some people love an audience, but many feel very nervous about it um, and would actually do anything to avoid public speaking. Personally, I'm the kind of person who would rather write a 10-page paper than give a 10-minute presentation. Um, why do we find public speaking so challenging? I think it's partly about performance anxiety uh, because we're afraid that our audience will judge us. Uh, but I think it's also a matter of familiarity. For many of us, we just haven't practiced that much, especially in an academic or a professional setting. Like anything though, public speaking is a learned skill. And that means it's something we can all develop. We can get better no matter where we're at. Now, uh, like any skill, we need to start off with some small steps. So today, I want to give you a few ideas of small ways that you can improve your presentation skills. If you're joining us live, we'd love to hear from you throughout the session. Um, so you can jump in anytime with comments or questions uh, in the YouTube live chat. So please take a moment to sign into YouTube and introduce yourself in the live chat. And when you do, I would love to hear about who inspires you in the area of public speaking. Um, it could be a pastor, a friend, um, a YouTuber, a radio host, uh, someone that you've seen on a TED talk, just someone that inspires you in the area of public speaking. So if you have, if you're joining us live, please take a moment, say hi in the live chat and share about somebody that inspires you. And that might be a great place for you to learn as well about other speakers that you can model yourself after. Now, in university, we spend a lot of time learning how to write well. We write paper after paper after paper. And often we spend a little bit less time doing presentations, but that's okay. Because in many ways, um, the skills that we need to write well are also the skills that will learn, help us learn to speak well. Writing and speaking are actually similar in terms of the process that we go through. Um, in the writing process, we go through four basic stages. First, idea generation, which includes selecting a topic, um, doing some background reading, refining our topic, um, maybe writing a research question and a working hypothesis, researching those kinds of skills. Then the second stage is outlining, refining uh, your thesis, arranging your ideas into an outline, things like that. Then our third step is drafting, where you're actually writing it out. And then fourth, editing and revising. This includes both global revisions, uh, which is kind of revisions of the whole thing, big things like ideas and structure, uh, but then also it includes sentence level revisions, things like grammar and mechanics. Now, so that's the writing process. Then we also have the speaking process. The speaking process The speaking process, according to Roman orator Cicero, includes five stages, and he gives those stages as invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Um, invention is coming up with ideas. Arrangement is deciding what order to put them in. Style means choosing the specific ways of expressing your ideas, keywords, phrases, examples, jokes, all of that. Um, memory is memorization, obviously, um, practicing until you master it, and then delivery, which is actually giving your presentation. 
Although these stages go by different names, there's actually a lot of similarity between the writing process and the speaking process. Um, for example, idea generation in a, and uh, invention, that's the same thing, slightly different names. Uh, Cicero uses a different name than we often do when we're talking about writing, but the same process, it's coming up with ideas. Um, outlining and arrangement, again, you're just organizing your ideas, putting them into a logical sequence. Um, even drafting uh, and styles share some similarity in that you're thinking about how best to express your ideas. So this should be great news. You probably already know a lot about writing that will help you develop good, solid presentations, uh, especially in those early stages of idea generation and outlining. Now, the later stages differ a little bit more but there's still some similarity. For example, in Cicero's version, um, we don't really see a, a specific stage for editing and revising, but that doesn't mean that you don't do revising, that you don't have to revisit and revise your plans. You'll probably do so, you'll just do so at a different point. Um, when we're writing, we tend to do that editing and revising right at the very end, polishing off our manuscript. During the speaking process, we do it a little bit earlier as we're preparing our outline or our notes for the presentation. So there's still a similarity there. And also, even though the final format is different, you'll notice that in both cases, whether it's writing or speaking, the final stages are very much about putting the polish on your ideas, shining them up for your audience. So there, there's some similarities, also some differences. When it comes to public speaking, we already have a lot of knowledge and experience to draw upon based on our knowledge of the writing process. Um, that said, writing and speaking are different, especially in the last three stages. And for the rest of our time today, I wanna talk about those differences and some tips for how you can thrive in those areas. Now, um, before we get into that, I do wanna hear from you. Um, so if you have a chance, jump into the live chat and say something about who you admire as a public speaker. Um, for me, I have lots of, lots of speakers that I, I admire. Um, some of them, uh, I enjoy the podcast Radio Lab. That's one of my favorites. Now, they have the advantage of being able to edit things after they prepare them. Um, but the thing that I love about uh, this, the style of that is how casual and how um, friendly and warm it is. And that's something that I want to, uh, to, to imitate in my own presentation. So that's something that I have learned a lot from. Um, if you have a chance, jump in and share who you find inspiring in the area of public speaking. Um, now let's begin in terms of tips by talking about the style stage. Um, so again, this is the part where you're choosing your keywords, your jokes, your stories, your examples, and all of that. The key to this stage is writing good notes for yourself, preparing some, something to support you as you're actually doing the presentation. This brings us to our first tip for today. Write two versions of your outline, a working outline and then a speaking outline. Um, in some situations, you might present with a full script that you will actually read word for word. That is, a, that is one context in which you might do a presentation. Um, for example, if you were reading a statement in court or giving a political speech, you might actually read a whole prepared speech word for word. However, in most cases, we're speaking in less formal circumstances. In some contexts, like a TED Talk, we might want to speak entirely without notes, be fully off the cuff. Um, however, these cases are actually relatively rare. It's not very often that we're required to do that. And they require a lot of preparation, a lot of hard work to be able to do that. Um, so in most cases, we're going to prepare to speak from some form of an outline, kind of a hybrid between not a, not a full script, not completely without a script, some sort of outline in between. In the long run, you want to aim for a fairly simple outline with just a few words here and there to keep you on track. Um, but you can't start there. When you're preparing a presentation, you should actually start with a fairly full outline, what we call a working outline. 
And this working outline has lots of detail. Um, and then gradually, as you prepare your speech, you should be able to reduce that outline down to a shell, which we call the speaking outline. The first version, the working outline, um, has long form ideas, often in full sentences. It has all the details, including all the little sub points. Um, here, for example, on the slide, you'll see that the speaker is planning to, uh, to share about um, deep sea research and A, that we don't really know that much about deep sea life and B, that we need to invest in deep sea research. So that's the plan for the speech. And the speaker is planning to start with a story about a new scientific discovery um, about an octopus, uh, a species of octopus that actually takes a really long time to hatch its eggs. Um, the, in this example, the speaker wants to use this story to help, re, uh, to, to help listeners realize how much we don't know. Um, so notice here, uh, you may not be able to read all of the text, but notice that the speaker's working outline has full sentences, carefully crafted, has all the details of the, the story, and then the main point that the speaker wants to get to, that we really don't know much about deep sea creatures. Now, in the speaking outline, you'll notice the same thing, same topic, same points, everything, but the speaker has reduced these ideas down to cues. There's no longer full sentences. It's now kind of key ideas. Um, the cues include things like dates, numbers, names, um, sources from the, for the information that the, that, the right, that the speaker needs to be sure to give credit to. Um, so these are all things that the speaker knows she needs to get right. Uh, the notes also include a few key phrases, things that the, the speaker has identified as really important that I need to say it this way. Um, and terms, key terms, like the species name of the ox octopus, things that the speaker needs to be sure to say correctly. Um, the speaking notes can also include things like uh, a guide to pronunciation for names. So if there's a name that the speaker doesn't know how to say correctly or is afraid that she will mispronounce, she could write it in, in kind of a phonetic way so that she can remember how to say it in the moment. Um, the speaking outline could also include short quotations if the speaker is planning to use a, a pithy remark from somewhere. Um, basically, the speaking outline needs to include anything that the speaker really, really needs to get right. But it needs to be reduced to a form that the speaker can quickly skim through to find the information that he or she needs. Um, the format can be flexible. Uh, so you can put your final speaking outline into a document on a piece of paper, or you can put it into index cards that you can flip through. The format doesn't really matter. You can choose what works for you. But the process is important. It's important to start with a working outline where you flesh things out in more detail, and then reduce that working outline to a set of speaking notes. And as you do that, as you do that process of reducing it down, you'll actually find yourself becoming more comfortable with the material so that the speaking outline will help you, um, it'll give you enough information so that you can flow through your ideas naturally and smoothly, just as if you were working with the uh, working outline itself. So that's our first tip. Um, and I do want to acknowledge Erin in the, the text chat. Thanks for joining us, Erin. Um, she says that she admires uh, David Platt, a pastor and author, as a public speaker. So that's another one to check out. Um, if you have others, keep them coming. Be glad to hear about that as we go. Um, and we can learn from each other who to check out. Um, let's now turn to the memory stage of the speaking process. This is the practice stage. Um, now, as I said a moment ago, most of us aren't going to memorize our full presentation. Uh, we'll probably have notes, but we don't wanna be tied too closely to those notes. So we need to have a pretty good idea when we're saying one thing, what's coming next. So memory is really important. Now, many of the strategies we need for memory are pretty commonsensical. To remember things, we need to practice. We need to repeat them over and over and over. So we just need to practice. Um, also, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, we wanna simplify gradually. So when we're practicing, we wanna start by practicing with the full working outline. Um, and 
with all the details that's in there. And then gradually, as we practice, reduce that outline to that speaking outline where it just has the, the key details. Uh, so simplify as you go to work with fewer and fewer notes. Uh, and then the last tip here for memorization is simply to write it out by hand. So you might take at some point your speaking outline, those few notes, and actually practice writing out exactly what you would say um, word for word, uh, kind of as if you were presenting it. And writing things down for many of us can help build memory because it plays on our audio visual uh, skills for learning. Uh, so that's a good way to work on memory. Uh, to work on other aspects of your presentation, like expression, there's really no replacement for practice. So try to practice in front of an audience or practice by recording yourself and then re replaying that later. Um, like I said, many of these strategies are obvious. They just take time. Um, but I do have one recommendation for you at this stage. Uh, and that is, while you're probably not gonna memorize your whole speech, you can memorize the first couple of sentences of your speech. And that will give you a lot of confidence um, and uh, will help you uh, seem confident to your audience too. Also, it will give you a chance to connect with your audience because now you don't need to focus quite so much on those first couple of sentences. You can just focus on the people on the other end. Um, so memorizing those first couple of sentences can give you a head start uh, in connection with your audience and in confidence. And that's worthwhile. So tip number two then, memorize the first couple of sentences of your presentation. Um, Adrian's commenting in the text chat as well uh, that, she, that he saw Oprah Winfrey live uh, and admired her speaking abilities. That's another wonderful, uh, another wonderful recommendation. And certainly she's built a career on her public speaking skills. Um, let's continue on and talk about delivery. In many ways, this is the most complicated stage because it's the most different from writing. And so it's less familiar for us. Sometimes we run into problems here with anxiety where our nerves get in the way. Um, other challenges that we can run into here include things like pace and volume um, or nonverbal communication. So let's talk about a few tips for this stage. Now, nerves, let's start there. Uh, as Joan Van Emden and Lucinda Becker point out in a very helpful book called Presentation Skills for Students, um, they point out that nerves are actually good. Nerves have an important biological function. They turn on our tap of adrenaline and adrenaline then gives that, that boost of energy and alertness that can help us focus can help us remember stuff, can help us share our enthusiasm about something. So nerves are good. However, um, sometimes they get in our way. Now, one of the things that we're often nervous about is that our audience will figure out that we're nervous. That's not necessarily a problem. Your audience might actually, when they see that you're nervous, they might actually empathize with you. They're like, yeah, that's, that's kind of intimidating presenting in front of people. Um, that's not a bad thing. If they recognize you're nervous and empathize with you, that's okay. Or they might even be flattered that you care enough about their opinion to be a little nervous. Um, as long as you don't let your nerves stop you, it's not necessarily a bad thing to let your nerves show. Um, one of my mentors observed me teaching one time and pointed out that I was quite nervous and he said to me that I would probably never get rid of my nerves entirely. And so what he told me as a piece of advice was to channel my nerves, channel my nerves into excitement and enthusiasm. And that's something I've tried to take seriously to, to turn my anxiety about presentation into energy and enthusiasm. So instead of being afraid of your own nerves, use them. Now, um, the also, Another important thing here is to use positive self-talk. It's okay to tell yourself, to acknowledge to yourself that you're nervous, but remind yourself that you can do it. Don't let nerves like tear you down. Um, remind yourself that you are capable and you can do it. 
Now, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, voice. How you pace yourself, how you um, present clearly. Let's start with pace. Um, it is possible to speak too slowly, but most of us have the opposite problem. Uh, there are two reasons for that. First, um, as speakers, we have already done all of our thinking. Uh, we've already done all the processing, all of the all of the the work of understanding these ideas, and we forget that our audience hasn't. Our audience still needs time to absorb. So that can be one reason we go too fast. Another reason we go too fast is sometimes we just want to get the presentation over and done with. And so we kind of rush through everything. If we have this mentality, we will go too fast. So how do we adjust our pace? Well, um, we can, the recommended speed for a presentation is about 100 to 110 words per minute. Um, you can practice that um, by taking a small chunk of your presentation, like take the first 100 words and practice timing yourself in reading it. Keep practicing until you can read 100 words in one minute without going too fast or too slow. Uh, you can also practice, even if you're not preparing for a particular speech, you can also just practice with any chunk of 100 words. Um, a really fun way to do this is checking out the website 100wordstory.com. That's 100wordstory.org, sorry. And there are a bunch of stories there that are exactly 100 words. Um, and if you practice reading those stories in one minute out loud, that's a really great way to get a feel for normal pace. And then that helps you build kind of a sense of what is normal, what is a good pace and build that into your speaking. And so then you can recognize when you start to go too fast or too slow. If you're joining us in the text chat, please feel free to keep those favorite speakers coming. Let's move on from talking about pace to thought, talking about pauses. Um, this is kind of similar to pace in that, but it's thinking a little bit about the big picture. Instead of thinking about the pace of a sentence and how fast our words are coming, thinking of the overall pace of our talk. We don't wanna come off as rushed uh, and we want our talk to be kind of controlled and measured. So a way that we can help to build appropriate pace is by building in brief pauses. To start with, you might consider pausing before you begin, when you refer to a visual aid, like a slide, uh, between sections of your talk, that is before starting a new point, um, to emphasize a particular point, and then after your presentation. A couple of comments here. Let's start with before you begin. Many, many people, like let's assume you're presenting in a room full of people and you start sitting down and you have to walk up to the front. Many, many people start talking while they are walking up to the front. Now that's problematic if you're being amplified, if you have a microphone or something because then the sound person has to turn you on before and you know, so that can be a little bit complicated from a logistical standpoint, but more importantly, Talking before you get up to the front is also bad for your rapport with the audience. Instead, walk up to the front to where you're going to stand, pause, smile, connect, take a second to connect with the audience, breathe, and then begin. This will make you seem much more in control and much more confident. So pause before you begin. Um, then also pause when you refer to a visual aid, like a slide or uh, some other kind of demonstration that you're making. Um, in this case, remember that whenever you're using a visual aid, your audience will be likely to be distracted by the visual aid that you're using. So give them a chance to kind of take a glance at it and then kind of glance back at you as well. So give them just a second there to take a glance and kind of figure out where they need to be paying attention. 
Another place to pause is between sections of your talk or between major points. Again, um, this helps your reader to keep track of where you are, in, or your reader, your audience, keep track of where you are in your points. Um, it's hard for your audience to track the organization of a talk orally. It's much easier on paper. Now on paper, you'll notice that we pause between paragraphs. We have a blank line or an indentation. We can do the same thing orally to help our audience just by pausing between sections of a talk. Um, we can also pause for emphasis, as I've noted, uh, and then also after your presentation. Again, this is about taking control of the situation and appearing professional. So make eye contact, say thank you, smile, take a second to breathe before walking off. So pausing at the end can also help you appear confident and in control. Now, one other challenge that we face in terms of our voice when we're speaking is clarity. If you've ever sung in a choir um, or ever had a vocal lesson, then you, you probably know that we're not as clear in speaking as we should be. There are two places especially where English speakers tend to be unclear. The ends of our sentences and when we pronounce numbers. Um, in English, it's just a characteristic of our, the cadence of English. We tend to trail off at the ends of our sentences. So it's easy for people to lose the last few words of a sentence. Um, you'll notice this in conversation when you don't understand something that somebody said, it's often the thing that was at the end of the sentence that you miss because it got lost. It, somebody dropped off or trailed off at the end of the sentence. So that's one place of vulnerability. Another place is with numbers. In oral communication, it's really easy to confuse numbers. Did, did she say 13 or 30? Uh, not quite sure. So how do we make it clearer? Well, um, practice saying tongue twisters. Google tongue twisters and practice enunciating clearly. As you practice, remember to move your mouth. Um, imagine that somebody in your audience maybe has an ear infection or some kind of hearing impairment and really needs you to move your lips so that they can read your lips. Practice as if they need to read your lips. Now that will help if somebody actually does have a disability in the audience um, or uh, has a bad ear infection, but also remember that that will help everybody, not just people with those, those extra needs, but it'll help everyone. Um, also watch the ends of your sentences. So record yourself and then play yourself back and, and check, am I tra trailing off at the end of a sentence? Uh, and then here's kind of the, one other key tip, tip number five for us today, pause slightly before and after you say a number. So for example here, she gave me 140 names. Notice just a slight pause there before and after the number. That can help to make the number clearer and to distinguish that number from another number. Um, Otherwise, 140 could very easily sound like 114 if you just kind of run those together. So pause slightly before and after saying a number. Now let's talk about one last area, nonverbal communication. This includes all sorts of things, movement, posture, gestures, and so on. Now, this is a very vital part of a presentation. This helps us express confidence and build that connection with our audience. So we definitely wanna pay attention here. Let's start with movement. Movement um, includes thinking about how you walk up before you even begin your talk, how you sit down after your talk. Remember to move energetically. We wanna build that positive energy, but don't be rushed. So move energetically, but not in a panic or a hurry move confidently, move cheerfully, and move directly. Go directly to your point, to the place where you want to be. All of those things will help you appear more confident. So actually practice how you walk up and how you walk down for a presentation. Also think about how you move during your talk. For example, maybe there's a section of your talk where you start to get a little bit more personal. Maybe a Q&A, 
Um, maybe you ask, uh, maybe you're engaging, just maybe telling a personal story. At those moments, get closer to your audience, lean in, move closer. That conveys that personal or that personal moment. So think about, can you do that? Can you get closer to your audience? Um, maybe can you come and sit down on a stool in front, then step back or, you know, so think about how you can move during your talk. Um, you might also want to turn and walk toward different parts of the room. Um, if you feel comfortable, you can walk a few steps from where you would, from your notes. Uh, you can also just turn, just turning your body so that everybody in the audience feels included. Think also about your posture. Uh, think about being, making sure that your body expresses openness. You don't want to be closed off. We all know that what this conveys. It either conveys disinterest or that you're freezing. Either way, not the best image. Um, so be open with your arms, be open with the, your legs. Um, also keep your shoulders relaxed so that you're not too tense. Uh, lean forward to hear questions. It conveys eagerness and interest in what your audience might be saying back to you. So think about your posture, practice your posture. Also think about gestures that you can use. Think about using your fingers to count off things. Uh, think about using the, one of my professors once described this as the two melon thing. Um, when you're making a comparison, use your hands as if you're holding two things and comparing them, seeing which one is better. Um, so think about gestures that you want to use. Um, obviously, we want to consider eye contact. Lots of people have said things about this, so I won't go into that. Um, think about your facial expression. The, what's your resting expression? Is it positive, a smile? Um, I won't say a whole lot about this because I think we already know lots about these things, but here's one tip for you. I always try to plan important gestures to write them right into my notes. Um, when I'm practicing, I will literally write in the margins of my notes. I usually print out my notes on pieces of paper and I'll literally write into my margins, sometimes highlight the things, the gestures that I want to make. Maybe not every gesture, but key ones, ones that I really want to draw attention to something, I'll write those in, um, in a different color, in a different font, right into my script. Um, so that can be a way that you can make your presentation, especially if you feel uncomfortable using gestures, that can be a way that you can make your presentation more compelling. Um, so these are just a few tips to get you started. Um, presentations are about so much more than eye contact and outlines. They're really about ideas. Now, that said, if we want people to understand and buy into our ideas, we do need to deal with some of these other things. We need to minimize distractions. We need to maximize rapport. And that's where everything that we've talked about today fits. If you can outline well, if you can practice well, if you can deliver well, then you have an opportunity to build a relationship with your audience that opens them up to consider your ideas. And that's when you'll really succeed in making a good impression. Now we are coming toward the end of our time together. So I do wanna thank you all for participating today. And if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the live chat right now. Um, and I'll, I'll respond to those either in the chat or I can respond orally. Um, while you're doing that, um, remember that you can, if you're attending live, you can use this session to earn credit towards the Lions Pride bonus program, and you can earn gift cards and, and swag through that. So uh, remember to complete the survey if you're attending live so that you can earn credit towards that program. Also, be sure to check out all the rest of our workshops. So if you visit ambrose.edu slash workshops, you'll see all of the rest of our workshops for this term. And then if you visit again in January, you'll see all of our slate of workshops for next term. Um, there will be some repeats, but there will also be a bunch of new ones. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, also, if you do have any other questions, feel free to contact us at studentsuccess at ambrose.edu. We would be very happy to chat with you or to direct your question to someone who can answer it. Um, 
I'm not seeing any comments or questions in the chat yet at this point. Again, if you do have another a favorite speaker to share, you can jump in there as well. Um, thanks again for joining us today. So glad to have you here. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Bye for now.